You're listening to a podcast by Redeemer Bible Church. Come visit us Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. or visit our website at RedeemerFortBend.org for more information. Thanks and enjoy. So one of the prevailing ideas in our culture today is that you are perfect just the way you are. We see slogans like, you know, love yourself, you be you, all over the place. These things, they make us feel good and they sell. However, our text this morning warns us that if nothing about us changes, if we remain just the way we naturally are, we will be alienated from the life of God and experience eternal judgment without forgiveness. So as we turn our eyes to Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 32, we will clearly see God's intention that all who know Christ be renewed, turning from our former life of sin and instead reflecting the righteousness of God. In our first point, we're going to see the biblical perspective of life without Christ and hear the call to be renewed by putting off the old self. And in our second point, we'll hear the call to be renewed by putting on the new self and see the outworking of this renewal in some practical ways. And as a heads up, this sermon is going to have a lot of cross-references to other uh, passages in the Bible. Don't try to turn to all of them. Uh, just listen to those and stay rooted in Ephesians 4. We'll always come back there. So, um, with that being said, let's go ahead and dive in. Starting at verse 17, as Paul begins this difficult section of instruction, he wants to remind his audience that he's speaking as God's mouthpiece regarding these matters. Verse 17 says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord. So, this is not from the mind of Paul. It's from the mind of God. What he's about to say is challenging and would surely seem harsh and abrasive to any in the audience who have become comfortable in their sin. Yet Paul knows the importance of calling his Christian brothers and sisters to repentance. This isn't just applicable to the Ephesians, right? We need this exhortation. So whether you're an adult, if you're a kid, if you're here in person, if you're watching online, listen up. Because when an apostle prefaces a statement with, this I say and testify in the Lord, we should pay close attention. So after reminding the audience that what follows is God's instruction, Paul gives the command, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Here we should ask an important question to help us better understand the passage, and that is, who are the Gentiles? Because elsewhere in the New Testament, including throughout the letter to the Ephesians, Gentiles is referring to the ethnic category of non-Israelites. And we see extensive efforts taken by Paul and others to actually bring the gospel to the Gentiles in order that they would repent and believe in the deity, death, and resurrection of Christ. And here in Ephesians 4, we see that Paul is instructing the Ephesian Gentiles to no longer walk as the Gentiles do. So how should we understand this? I think Paul's words a few chapters earlier in Ephesians 2 verse 12 can help clarify this a little bit. He writes that the Ephesians were previously separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So while the Ephesians are Gentiles, the instruction to no longer walk as the Gentiles do is emphasizing the prior pagan, depraved lifestyle of the Gentiles who are alienated from God. But the Ephesian believers are not so. They though Gentiles in the flesh have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. And so they should be characterized by righteousness, not the wickedness of their former pagan lives. 
And God's description of their former way of life or their old self is very grim indeed. Look at verses 17 through 19. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. In saying, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, we understand that the readers of this letter did at one time walk as the Gentiles do. And Paul is calling them out of that old way of life. Indeed, he says their lives must look different than before. They are no longer to be characterized by the sins in which they once walked. Paul emphasizes this again throughout Ephesians. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. And Paul is saying, You used to follow Satan. And in Ephesians 4, he again lays out exactly what that entails. He says that those who do not know God do so in the futility of their minds. And this word futility can also be translated as perverseness or depravity. And it carries a sense of vanity and helplessness. Paul reminds his audience, previously they had no hope. They were without God. And they were helpless to set themselves right with God by their own ability. And Paul goes on in verse 18, chapter 4. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So here we see the spiritual corruption that's ultimately darkened the understanding of these unbelievers. And it's helpful to actually think through this verse backwards so that we can see the logical progression that Paul is presenting here. So if we look at verse 18 in reverse, we read, Due to their hardness of heart, ignorance is in them, which makes them darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God. Paul says the root cause of spiritual blindness is the Gentiles' hard hearts. They are stubborn, and their perception of God's law is suppressed to the point of utter blindness. And in not rightly perceiving God, they're then left in ignorance of what's good and evil. And this, in turn, leaves them separated from the life of God and spiritually blind to God's standard of holiness. This, indeed, is a dark and dangerous place to be, cut off from God because of hardness of heart. And Paul doesn't stop there. He continues in verse 19. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The sin of the Gentiles has ceased to bear on their consciences. They are calloused, they're dulled to the severity of sin, and they have fully given themselves over to it. Paul here uses the word sensuality or unbridled lust to describe the full extent to which the Gentiles have embraced their sin. They're greedy to practice every kind of impurity. I want more sin of every kind. I want all of it. That is the cry of the unregenerate Gentile heart. And this is really the cry of our hearts apart from Christ because by nature, we love our sin, and we hate God. At the end of Romans 1, Paul gives an expanded description of this universal depravity that described the Gentiles here, and it describes our natural state as well. In Romans 1, starting at verse 28, it says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, 
malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Friends, this is spiritual death. And when we read the Bible's description of sinful human nature, we know that justice demands punishment for such wickedness. And with trembling, we must acknowledge that the axe ought to fall on us too. We are guilty of these things. We've sinned. We've encouraged sin in others. And in our sinful, fallen state, we face the terrifying prospect of eternal death in hell. God's righteous judgment demands that our sin be paid in full. Yet, Paul wants to encourage his audience to spiritual life in Christ. Look at verse 20. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. So here we see the clear and wonderful expectation that a change of life is in order for those who follow Jesus. Paul says, that is not the way you learned Christ. Christ is different from the slavery to sin you once knew. And Paul would know, since he was the one who taught them. We know that from the first few verses of Acts 19. Paul was in Ephesus for two whole years. And during that time, he didn't just teach the Ephesians. He taught the entire region about the gospel. And Paul knows that God has ordained the spreading of the gospel as the means by which people access the new life found in Christ. That's why he spent so much time in Ephesus, so that people might hear about Christ and be taught in him, so that they would see the deception of their sin and the truth that is in Jesus, that they would turn to him and be saved and set free from their bondage to sin and united to God as adopted children. That is how they learned Christ from Paul. And this is why we see so much effort taken by the apostles to go to the ends of the earth so that people might hear the good news. And friends, this is why we share the gospel too. We need to be aware that this reality is still true today. We are surrounded by people who are alienated from the life of God due to their hardness of heart. Their only hope for salvation is Jesus. And Jesus commands us to tell others about him. So may we be faithful in our zeal for sharing the gospel. So Paul remembers exactly what they were taught and what they were accountable for knowing because he taught them. And he reminds them of the truth of the gospel in Ephesians 4 verses 22 through 24. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Paul is describing repentance. Those who have rightly learned and believed in Christ are to put off the old self, be renewed in the spirit of their minds, and put on the new self. And the voice of the verbs here is actually really important, and it communicates some key truths about the nature of our salvation. So when Paul says that his audience must put off the old self and put on the new self, the voice of put off and put on calls attention to the audience. It's calling the audience to do something, to put off your old self and put on the new self as, as if it you are removing an old, worn-out garment, and you're putting on a fresh new garment. However, the voice of be renewed is passive, which means that the audience is to receive the action of renewal 
which is performed by someone else. The audience isn't renewing themselves. Someone else is renewing them. This, of course, is God. God is the one who renews us and enables us to repent and to see clearly the glory of Christ and the futility of our old life and the wonder of our new life in him. And God's renewal of our lives is ongoing. He continues to faithfully build up and sanctify his people, distancing us from our sin and drawing us nearer to Christ. And this full renewal is necessary because of the extent of our sinfulness. Putting off our old self is not a matter of just changing our behavior or cleaning ourselves up because apart from Christ, our lives are thoroughly corrupt through deceitful desires, according to verse 22. And we're helpless to change our own hearts and become right with God by our own merit. No, friends, we need a hard reset. We need forgiveness, and we need to be changed from the very core of our being. We need to see God rightly and to submit ourselves to him as Lord and to depend fully on his mercy in Christ. This is what Paul means when he writes that his audience be renewed in the spirit of their minds. Consider how Paul describes this same phenomenon in 2 Corinthians 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For believers, God has turned the lights on in our hearts. And what a contrast to the darkened understanding with which Paul described the old self earlier in verse 18. This fundamental change that God does in our hearts brings with it the new self, which is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Friends, the old self looks like Satan, but the new self looks like God. Paul uses his own life as an illustration of this transformation in 1 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 1, starting at verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So as we wrap up this first point, putting off the old self, I hope we can see in these verses the clear expectation that the Christian life, the new self, look different than our lives as non-believers, our old self. And I hope we see the need for, God, for renewal in God's likeness. So when the world around us insists that we're fine, just the way we are, we must remember that just the way we are, according to God, is corrupt and sinful and damned. But continuing in our lives of sin is not the way we learned Christ. So if you've heard otherwise, you need to recognize Paul tells us the truth here, and we need to bring our own thinking into conformity with what Jesus is telling us through his apostle. So consider what you understand of Christ. Do you believe in a gospel that is permissive of a lifestyle characterized by unrepentant sin? Sin. 
If so, Paul says you have learned something different than the gospel of Christ and are headed for eternal destruction, alienated from the life of God. Listen closely to the apostles' words in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Christians forsake their sin and strive for lives of righteousness and holiness. God has renewed us, enabled us, and commanded us to do so. Have you become callous to your sin? Perhaps even giving yourself up to sin? If so, you need to repent. That is not the way you learned Christ. Put on the new self and pursue righteousness and holiness. But how can we know if we are callous to our sin or, or if we've given ourselves over to it? Because sin is deceptive and it's hard for us to see sometimes. I would encourage you to think of a recent situation in which you sinned and ask yourself, are you grieved by it? Are you saddened by how your sin grieves God? Have you confessed it to God and earnestly sought forgiveness and healing? Or... Do you think little of it? Are you unbothered by your sin? Does your life show a pattern of sin for which you feel no weight on your conscience? Or worst of all, do you consider yourself to be pretty much free of sin? Friend, if there is no acknowledgement of sin or godly grief towards sin in your life, your heart is calloused and you're dangerously deceived. I plead with you, see your sin for what it is, repent, and cast it far away from you. You should also ask, has God renewed you? Has he changed your heart, causing you to desire him, to grieve your sin, and to hate your sin? If you've not experienced this work of God in your heart, this will probably be the most important 30 seconds of the entire sermon for you, because you need to know you are a sinner by nature and by choice. And when you stand, when you die, you will stand before Almighty God, and you'll give an account for everything that you've done. You need to know that you have no righteousness in yourself, and without Christ, you will die in your sins. But God has extended mercy to guilty sinners like you and me by offering up his own son, Jesus Christ, to make full atonement for us by dying in our place and rising from the dead to prove that our debt has been paid in full. He now commands everyone, everywhere, to believe in the gospel and to repent. He promises to save all who trust in him. Turn to Jesus and the Holy Spirit will renew your soul. We also have to examine our lives for God's ongoing renewal, shaping us more and more into the image of Christ. So consider how you view God's word and its ability to change your heart. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We must regularly seek God in his word and strive to obey what he says. We must invite God's word to convict us of our sin and to reveal to us our need for Christ. And we must pray that God would increase our understanding in his word and conform us to the image of Christ. And in light of God's word in the Bible, we, we have to consider what do we think about? Are we renewing our minds in the things that we think about? Colossians 3.2 gives us a clear instruction to set our minds on the things that are above so I ask, do you think about these things? Are you actively training your mind to contemplate what God says you should be thinking about? Things that are above, 
things that are pleasing to God? Do you meditate on the gospel regularly? Do you marvel at the glory and majesty and righteousness of God? Do you contemplate the depth of your sin and your need for forgiveness? Do you think about the mercy of Jesus in offering up himself as a sacrifice for sinners? Do you rejoice in his victory over death? Do you long for his return? Friends, these are all things which the natural mind cares nothing about. But for those whom God has drawn near to himself through Christ, we are new creations. God has worked a mighty act of renewal in us by causing our dead, evil hearts to beat with faith and love for Jesus. This should change everything about us, especially how we think. We must long for our every thought to be obedient to Christ. The following point in this sermon has a lot to say about the outworking of God's renewal in our actions. And this is critical because what we do reveals much about who we are at heart. And if we say we belong to Jesus, we should be looking more and more like Jesus, inwardly and outwardly. So with that, let's continue to our second point, point number two. Be renewed by putting on the new self. I'm going to read these verses again because the way that they are phrased is important in showing Paul's argument here. Um, So I want you to listen closely for the pattern that Paul is using to describe the new self. Starting at verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are God in Christ forgave you. So as we read these verses, perhaps you notice the pattern in which they call for change. Most of them are presenting a contrast between behaviors or actions which characterize the old self and those which characterize the new self. And while we want to emphatically hold to justification by faith alone in Christ alone, we can't miss this clear call that our lives change in response to our heart change. So let's look at each of these verses in a little bit more depth to better understand the fruits that the renewed life bears. Verse 25 begins with the word therefore, and that tells us that whatever follows is the logical next step of what came before. And so in verse 24, Paul called the audience to put on the new self. And here he elaborates on the outworking of this new life in Christ. He goes on in verse 25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Falsehood is a mark of the old, unregenerate life and is to be put away as such. Recall Jesus' words to the Jews in John 8. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And we saw earlier in verse 21 that the truth is in Jesus. So in putting off the old self and putting on the new self, we are changing our allegiance from Satan to Christ and imitating our new master in truth, because the truth is in him. And our truthfulness towards one another is an essential part of belonging to a common body in Christ. Paul urges his audience, speak the truth with your neighbor, for you are members one of another. Their mutual belonging to Christ's body is the fundamental reason for speaking the truth, because the truth is in Jesus. Just imagine the absurdity of limbs that are lying to one another, right? The eye could lead the foot astray and suddenly the whole body is in danger. And so it is with falsehood in God's church. And this command to put away falsehood extends beyond just telling one another things that are factually true. It calls for putting away our false pretenses and living in a way that is genuine and trustworthy. Paul continues in verses 26 and 27, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. These two verses have been notoriously difficult to interpret 
because they seem to clash with other parts of Scripture which warn gravely against anger. There are many, but here are just a few. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7.9, Proverbs 14.29, Matthew 5.22, and maybe most famously, James 1.20, which says, The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And just a few verses later in Ephesians 4, Paul is going to insist that anger be put away, along with bitterness and wrath and clamor and slander and malice. Indeed, the overwhelming majority of references to anger are warning against the sinful anger we are most prone to as fallen human beings. Yet, in saying, be angry and do not sin, Paul is implying that it's possible to be angry without sinning. Maybe you've heard this referred to as righteous anger or anger against things that are morally horrifying or unjust. Clearly, Christ was angry with the money changers in the temple, but his anger was sinless. And sin in the church, which, which is Paul's audience here, right? The church in Ephesus. It's certainly grounds for righteous indignation. And Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5 say that disciplinary action should be taken in that event. However, this acceptable anger is quickly accompanied by two warnings. Do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger. Even if anger is justified, it's never to be expressed in a sinful way or given time to develop into the festering sinful anger that's no longer righteous. And extending the duration of our anger and not dealing with the cause presents, according to these verses, it presents the devil with an opportunity to lead us into sin. And in the context of sin in the church, that presents an opportunity for satanic influence to actually damage other believers. This completely undermines any righteous aspect of our anger and instead makes us the target of righteous anger because we've sinned. So remember James 1.20, for the anger of man, including our righteous anger, does not produce the righteousness of God. So friends, deal with the source of your anger quickly even if it's justified. And do not make yourself vulnerable to sin by allowing your anger to linger. And may we as a church also be diligent to guard against sin in our body, that we may stand against the schemes of the devil. Let's continue on, see more of what the new self looks like. In verse 28 we read, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. What a complete change. The renewed thief gives. He stops the thieving of his old self, and he becomes a hard worker, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. His stealing becomes giving. His robbery becomes generosity. And a heart of generosity is indeed a mark of the new self. 2 Corinthians 9.7 is a familiar verse. God loves a cheerful giver. And the eagerness of the churches in, in Macedonia from 2 Corinthians 8 is an excellent example of this, where it says that the abundance of their joy in God motivated them to give according to and even beyond their means. Friends, the old self takes, but the new self gives. And indeed, the renewed heart leaps at the opportunity to be generous. So we should ask ourselves, do we individually and as a church, reflect this same eagerness towards generosity, especially for the sake of God's kingdom? Are we characterized by our love for giving? We should be. Moving to verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. The renewed vocabulary is pure and wise and discerning and edifying. Mouths which once uttered corrupting and destructive words are instead to speak only what is good for building up and giving grace. This sets a really high bar for this, the Christian speech, right? And it's difficult. No corrupting talk. Only what is good for building up and 
as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. James 3 speaks much of the difficulty of mastering our tongue and also the necessity of doing so. James 3, starting at verse 7, says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Paul and James both know that the sinful corruption of human hearts bears fruit in corrupt speech. We are really quick to malign and slander and curse, wrongfully accuse, lie, degrade, and otherwise sin in the words that come out of our mouths. But in both Ephesians and James, the same message is loud and clear. Sinful speech is inconsistent with the gospel of Christ. When the unbelieving world sees corrupting speech come from Christians who ought to be speaking only what is good, our hypocrisy damages our witness for Christ. We must bear fruit that is in step with the truth of the gospel, which means we have to strive to master our speech for righteousness. But how should we speak about people or leaders who either have done or maybe continue to do obviously evil things? Well, we want to pray for their salvation we pray for justice against their wickedness, pray for God's will to be done, and as the next chapter in Ephesians makes abundantly clear, we do speak out against their evil deeds in order that their wickedness might be brought to light and corrected. Yet even in exposing and condemning sin, as Ephesians 5.11 makes clear that we ought to do, our speech must be edifying and grace-filled. We must resist the temptation to curse those made in God's image. Moving on to verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So let's first talk about what does it mean that the Holy Spirit has sealed us for the day of redemption? Because that's going to explain our motivation for not wanting to grieve the Holy Spirit. Titus 3.5 says he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And earlier uh, in Ephesians 1, verse 13, Paul writes, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. For all who are in Christ, God's Holy Spirit has regenerated us and sealed us as a guarantee of our inheritance, which is our redemption and our, our eternal life, until we acquire possession of it, either when we die or when Christ returns. And this is a marvelous and redeeming work that the Holy Spirit performs. And our response should be nothing less than utter gratitude and devotion to God. This is why Paul instructs the Ephesians not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He has worked a miracle in their souls, giving them new life. So, if we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit, we need to ask, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? Isaiah 63 uses very similar language to describe the Israelites' relationship to God, and it's helpful for us to Look at that and understand. So Isaiah 63, verse 10 says, But they, the Israelites, rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Those on whom God had set his precious and very great promises in the Old Testament, protecting them, providing for them, caring for them, 
who should have acted lovingly towards God as children, instead rebelled against God and thus grieved his Holy Spirit. And in much the same way, we who have been adopted into God's family can grieve God's Spirit by our rebellion. If we look at the, next, er, at the text immediately before and after this verse, we can see the most specific examples of what certainly grieves the Holy Spirit. So verse before, verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. And then skipping to verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. So by the immediate context, we can see that corrupting talk, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice are certainly things which grieve God's Holy Spirit. And they're things that most of us are guilty of nearly every day. Indeed, we can more broadly say that our sin in general grieves the Holy Spirit because sin is rebellion against God. And we are to be after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Friends, hear the call in these verses to put these things away from you. They grieve God's Holy Spirit, and they are markers of the old self, not the new self that we have in Jesus. Looking back at verse 31, we read, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Again, we see Paul use the words put away in reference to bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. And I hope this repetition of put away, put away, put away has shown us the huge emphasis Paul is placing on removing the evil marks of the old self and putting on the new self. And in these final two verses, we see what we might call the renewed demeanor, kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving, instead of bitter and wroth and angry and slanderous and malicious. Christians have undergone divine heart surgery. God has removed our heart of stone and given us a heart of flesh. And this renewed demeanor, softened by the grace of God, is motivated ultimately by God's forgiveness towards us in Christ. God put forward his only son to live perfectly, to die in our place, to bear God's wrath for us, to pay our debt in full, and to rise from the dead in order that we might repent and be rescued from the eternal judgment our sin deserves. We must forgive one another, remembering how God has forgiven us in Christ. Sadly, many use Christ's forgiveness as an excuse to sin. They think, well, Jesus loves me just as I am. He's already paid for my sin, so therefore I don't have to obey God's word because I'm already saved. Friends, that is a lie. Because Paul ends this section by saying that the key motivator for us to be forgiving kind and tender-hearted and all the other virtuous good things that he describes in this passage, the motivation for all of those things is that God in Christ forgave us. A right understanding of God's forgiveness in Christ demands that our lives be made new in righteousness and holiness. So do you see the contrast in each of these verses? The new self should look clearly different and in many ways completely opposite from the old self, without Christ. We are to put away our sin and put on righteousness as those who have been renewed by God. And we would do well to test our own lives according to these verses, right? We should ask ourselves if, if we speak the truth and put away falsehood. Are you characterized by authenticity and integrity in your lives and in your relationships? Are you careful to put away unrighteous anger and avoid sinning in anger? And when you do become angry with your spouse or your kids or your parents or coworkers, 
Do you submit your anger to God? And do you apologize when you sin in anger? Do you share with those in need? Is your heart eager to give, especially for the sake of God's church? Do you offer your time and your abilities and your resources to help others? And do you do it willingly or begrudgingly? And consider your speech. Do you speak only what is good for building up and giving grace? Do you gossip about others? How do you talk about people that you don't really like? Moreover, how do you talk about political leaders that you don't like? Is your speech about them grace-filled and good for building up? As Christians, our speech represents Christ, so we must resist the temptation to speak in a corrupt way because we want to reflect Christ properly. Do you consider how your sin grieves the Spirit of God? Fight diligently against your sin in order to avoid grieving God's Holy Spirit. Have you put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice? Or are you holding any of these things close to your heart? Consider how these sins erode your relationships with other people and especially with God and strive against them. Are you kind and tender-hearted and forgiving? Do you remember the extent to which God has forgiven you? God's forgiveness should motivate you to put your sin to death and pursue righteous obedience to him. And do you demonstrate forgiveness to your spouse, your kids, your siblings, and your coworkers? Remember how God forgave us in Christ and forgive others. And this whole principle of a 180-degree turn from our sin and to God applies also to sins that aren't explicitly listed in these verses. It's not supposed to be an exhaustive list. It's, it's an idea that Paul is presenting, right? So, for example, if you were once an adulterer, are you now characterized by faithfulness? And if you used to be characterized by laziness, are you now exhibiting a godly work ethic? Does that characterize you? And perhaps in hearing these things, you realize you've, you've maybe not put away sins which you ought to put away. Friend, repent and cast these sins away from you. Holding on to them indicates a poor understanding of the gospel. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. And it's inconsistent with the new life we have in Christ. So to finish up, I want to say, if anyone here listening is not a Christian, I ask you, Do you think you are fine just the way you are? If so, this text testifies that you are darkened in your understanding, ignorant of God, and corrupt through deceitful desires. Pray to God that he might renew you in the spirit of your mind and repent. Cast yourself on the mercy of Christ. He has indeed extended mercy even at the cost of his own life. He offers full atonement for those who trust in him. But he also offers and promises full judgment for those who persist in their hard-hearted rebellion. Friend, I urge you, bend the knee to Christ. He will save you, and he will give your dead heart new life. And if you have repentantly trusted in the gospel of Christ, consider the outcome of your life. Does it resemble the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness? This does not mean that you're sinlessly perfect, okay? But rather that you are no longer characterized by the sins in which you once walked. If you do indeed have patterned persistent sin in your life, I likewise urge you to repent. This grieves the Holy Spirit who has renewed your heart and sealed you for the day of redemption. Seek to kill this sin by God's help, and instead do whatever is the godly opposite. Put on the new self. So in short, this text calls us to be renewed. Firstly, that we be renewed by putting off the old self, and secondly, that we be renewed by putting on the new self. 
and in considering the depth of our sin and our great need for renewal, may we look to God as David does. We read earlier in Psalm 51, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Let's pray.